Hey guys, welcome back to Come Again, where all geek culture collides. And if you're new to the channel, make sure to leave a comment and let us know what you think. And please, don't forget to smash that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all things geek culture. Today on the show, John and I have the great pleasure of interviewing comic book writer Steve Orlando. Steve has been writing DC Comics' Batman The Shadow six-part miniseries as of late, which just released issue number four and is currently working on Dynamite Entertainment's version entitled The Shadow Batman, which will also be a six-part miniseries due out in October of 2017. So what's this new series about? The world's greatest mystery. The world's greatest detective. They can barely stand each other. So how will they possibly deal with the world's greatest evil? What legacy can two of the world's most enduring icons of justice leave once they discover an ancient evil has been living inside the world they protect for centuries, attached to its very heart? Can Batman and the Shadow save the world without killing it in the process? We'll find out a little bit more about this series from the writer himself, Steve Orlando, right now. There you go. Hi, Steve. How you doing? Hey, what's going on, man? All right. All right. Thank you for joining us on Comic Ed, man. I really appreciate it. That's great. <laughs> yeah, happy to. Um, so you're doing, you're currently doing a DC's version of the Batman Shadow crossover, right? Yes. And you're getting ready, you're starting to work on the uh, Dynamite version of that, too. Um, oh, I'm already deep in it, man. I'm already deep in it. Right. Uh, will Dynamite series be a continuation of that, or will it be its own thing entirely? Uh, it'll stand on its own, uh, certainly, because we don't want people to feel like they have to pick up both. Uh, but at the same time, there will be like thematic and character arcs that you'll see um, that are certainly enlivened if you've read both. But each one is a complete story on its own, the sort of meta story of where these characters are going. Uh we have something to say uh, in each in each one, and then they say something greater together. But you don't need both. Okay. So, like, they'll pretty much, like, complement each other, though, right? Yeah, that's the basic thought. And it's for not like, for Dynamite's version, it's not like Batman and the Shadow are meeting each other again for the first time, though, right? Will Absolutely they... not. Okay. Hi, Steve. My name's John. <laughs> uh, pleasure talking to you. Um, so you've done Detective Comics Rebirth, Justice League of America Rebirth, uh, Batman Beyond Number Twelve. Uh, let's see what was, uh, Batman Night of the Monster Men. Um, so you're pretty much the driving force behind the new take on Batman and DC Comics. How is that going to transfer over <laughs> to the Dynamite universe? Uh, well, don't tell Tom and Scott that. You know, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm certainly the driving force behind Batman when he appears with the Shadow. Okay. <laughs> uh, controversial opinion uh but i'm sorry uh how do i approach that with the shadow and dynamite is, it, is that the question right right uh well you know the, the the thing is is like what we the whole idea i mean these books take place in the present and they take place in the current continuity or not, i shouldn't say current continuity but the current sort of status quo of batman uh but the whole idea as well is to is to create books um, that speak about what these characters mean and, and why they're so special. So in relation to Dynamite, I mean, we've got Batman. We're going to get everything we can out of him. Uh, you know, especially in relation to the other series, you're going to see characters you never saw in the other series. You're going to see settings you never saw in the other series. Um, and you're going to see a world that has sort of been like happening on the fringe of Batman Shadow. And Shadow Batman opens it up even further. Um, but it's just the idea we we want to craft with dynamite, the iconic Batman that is still of the moment, you know, Robin Damien is in the book. Uh, we want to create these things that if you look at it and you squint, you can certainly see how they fit into the greater context of all these characters. Uh, at the same time, we want to, when it comes to Batman, uh, and we're casting him against the shadow to say something about him. We want to make sure that you have these two moments, uh, in, in each story. Uh, a strong statement about what the shadow means, a strong statement about what, the, what Batman means, and the cool thing about the shadow of Batman, especially in the Dynamite book, where we're living a little more in the shadow's world, 
uh, is that you, because of their both metatextual and their in-story relationship, you can really say things about those characters that you really couldn't pull out of them with any other pairing. You know, Shadow has a relationship with Batman that is totally unlike that of Dick Grayson's, that's unlike that of Gordon's, that's unlike that of Superman's. Um, and what he represents is, is, is this force that forces Batman to look within himself and evaluate himself because he is that thing uh, that Batman cannot ever know. And, and for him, that's in many ways in that he symbolizes Batman's mortality. So we have this character that is a living memento mori to Batman who, you know, is the, symbolizes the best of us. You know, he's, he's in many ways what we can achieve as people. Um, you just have to get in there and, and, and tell, say something with him that is totally unique. And it's an opportunity to do that because, uh, as I said, um, you have a character in the shadow that really is the one person that is a check on what Batman has, intellectually at least, because for the world's greatest detective, someone who is inherently unknowable uh, is uh, is problematic from the start, and as the story goes on, potentially infuriating, uh, but he also might know the things about Batman that, that no one else does, that Bruce has to know. Right. And it's interesting that you say Damien's going to be in this book, too, because it, it's kind of going to be interesting to see how Damien... Uh, interacts interacts with the shadow yeah, since yeah. the shadow's more or less kind of a uh, adult version of Damien. I, I could see the shadow being trained by Ray Jago at yeah. one point. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, maybe or maybe the shadow training Ray Jago, you know, yeah, yeah, Raz is, yeah. Raz, yeah. Raz is not that old uh, as as immortals go. That's true. I think uh, the shadow might be older. So is that like a little hint of things to come with this new series? Uh, it's a hint of things to come in relation to the, the Damien Shadow relationship because, you know, they are, uh, they have a lot in common, you know, uh, and, and, and their differences obviously come to light in the book as well. But in many ways, you know, Shadow looks at Damien, who is a little more utilitarian, who is a little less nostalgic. Um, and, you know, only in the relative recent times has given up killing and all these things. And Shadow sees uh, someone who is maybe more like he wishes Bruce could have been. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, is unruly. He's out of, you know, he makes it, he, he makes rash decisions. So there's still something uh, for the Shadow to hone uh, within, within Robin. And I think the, at first, I'm sure he thinks that Damien is in many ways a better version of Batman. But as the story goes on, uh, you know, none of the characters are perfect, and the whole idea of this series and of the greater two-part series is that, you know, all of these characters are imperfect by definition, and it's only through working with each other that they can get the best out of each other. There is a generational aspect to these guys that I think is really, really cool. You know, we like to say, you know, people will always say that Batman is the real face and Bruce Wayne is just a mask. Uh, I would even posit if that's true, then at least within these stories, Shadow is the grandfather, Batman is the father, and Damien is the and Robin is the grandson. That actually uh, makes a lot of and, sense, yeah. especially given what you guys have revealed in uh, DC's version of the uh, Shadow Batman crossover. Um, yeah. Really loving those stories, by the way. Yeah, thank you, man. Riley and Scott have been outstanding. Uh, I'm trying not to say too much since John hasn't had a chance to <laughs> read it yet. Um, <laughs> and I'm ashamed because I'm a huge Shadow fan. So, uh, But since you're part of Batman DC Rebirth creative team, as well as both DC's Batman and the Shadow and Dynamite's The Shadow Batman, uh, should we consider these stories in canon for Batman, or should we consider them similar to the way DC and Image handled Batman Spawn in the 90s? Uh, I can't speak to how DC and Image handled Batman Spawn, but I would say sort of what I said earlier. We want to create something where, you know, we're not making, we can't, you know, for, for, for boring legal reasons and ownership reasons, we can't make a definitive statement, um, you know, because obviously to one company owns the shadow, one company owns Batman. So, it, it, you know, no other book could refer to things that aren't owned by DC and vice versa once these things are over. But because of the rich history of these characters and, and, and sort of what they represent in, 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 in here, superhero fiction and pop fiction, our hope is that, again, we're, create, we're crafting something that sort of sums up the essence of the shadow. And what that really means in relation to the question of continuity is it could easily all be in continuity. And at the same time, uh, just like a lot of the things about the shadow, it could easily all be alive. Uh, and, and, and I think there's a beautiful character in relation to that because that is his essence, it, you know. He, he is the essence of mystery, 
So we want to create something that makes a statement and easily could posit a potential secret history for these characters. Uh, well, at the same time, you will never know because to, to not know uh, and to be unknowable, that, that is the shadow at his core. So that kind of that kind of answers my question without revealing too much for John's sake and for other listeners who haven't had a chance to read the DC version of the crossover. Uh, there were a lot of revelations in the first uh, two or three issues involving the shadow and Batman's history and everything. So that I, I understand you can't really go into specifics and say, no, this is exactly continuity or not, but it, it does leave us fans really really curious to that fact uh is there anything uh you can help us to or say to us other than what you have said uh to kind of ease our minds at um that intertwining history aspect of you know the without revealing too much for the fans no, and honestly, I don't. There will be nothing else because that, that's that that is that is the shadow. Uh, I mean, you may want to know more, but in the same way, Bruce wants to know more about the shadow, and he simply cannot know. So, to be honest with you, there is there is no there will be no further clarification outside of what you see in the six issues, because that struggle, uh, in many ways, people for yearning for greater information. And that's the same yearning Batman has within the book. That That is the essence of knowing the shadow and coming face to face with the shadow. So what you see in the book is is, is what you'll have. And, and beyond that, to ponder that and, and to try to uncover what the truth is, that that is the experience of knowing him. Uh, and so that, that is definitely where we want to leave it on purpose in many ways. Okay. Um, okay, so you've worked on uh, the th uh, 13 episodes of the Mighty Morphin issues. Power Rangers. I said issues. You said episodes. <laughs> Sorry, I've been watching a lot of Power Rangers. Uh, you've uh, worked on 13 issues of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers from Boom Studios. Uh, what hand did you have exactly in helping to create such uh, an awesome series? And I am really loving it, by the way. And how involved were you in the creation of Lord Dracon? Well, uh, to be honest, I was uh, not involved at all because my uh, I worked on the Bulk and Skull backup stories in each of those issues. Okay, uh, awesome. So, so when the book came together, uh, the I had almost as a lark just said, you know, you guys should really do like an Archie style Balkan and skull book, and uh, they actually said that's a great idea. So the whole, I mean, the basic idea was knowing, I mean, other than knowing what was going to happen with Dracon, knowing that the main series was going to be pretty serious and and go in some directions. Um, we wanted to do the, this sort of more lighthearted uh, backup material to balance that out. So in relation to Lord Dracon, other than providing a palate cleansing sort of uh, unquestionably lighter hearted balance to that, not any direct connection to that, but from the start, we knew that we wanted to create these small bulk and skull adventures uh, to, to give people a step away from the headier, sort of heavier story that Kyle uh, and, and Hendry had been doing in the main series. Uh, just like how you would cut away to their sort of more misadventures within the within the book itself. So um, we were part of the book from the outset, uh, you know, working with Corinne Howell on it, just having that sort of more, uh, you know, sprightly, uh, energetic style, always been a part of it uh, versus the sleeker style of the main book. Um, but sort of creating that, that those two pagers uh, as something that could just be like a little nice cleansing note at the end, a light note at the end, to go against what was going on in the main series. Um, now, I watched another interview you did earlier in the year um, for a podcast uh, where you uh, they asked you kind of a similar question to what I'm getting ready to ask you. Uh, so I've got to kind of change this question up a little bit. Um, excluding Batman, Supergirl, Midnighter, and The Shadow, which I know is your all-time favorite comic book character, uh, who is your favorite comic book character? And if given the chance, which title would you love to write for? Oh, well, it's actually easy because you ex there was a major exclusion because I've never worked on him before. At least I haven't that time. But my favorite comic character is easily Martian Manhunter. Uh, you know, without question. Uh, and then, you know, in the time since I, whenever I gave that interview, I was lucky enough to work on him uh, in the Mar in the Marvel the Martian, Martian Manhunter crossover. Uh, that we did with Frank Barbarian and Aaron Lepresti, but uh, I love John Jones. 
Um, I, I, I love sort of everything he's about and sort of, in my opinion, the greater tragedy of his origin versus other characters that have similar origins uh, in being a parent and sort of losing, lo leaving those things behind on Mars, which I think is even greater than what Supergirl went through, being a teenager and leaving people behind on Krypton, and even greater than what Superman went through, being a baby and not really knowing anything in a tangible way, but knowing that something that was there and then was not there. Uh, I love the tragedy of Martian Manhunter. I love the power and I love the elegance of him. Uh, favorite character, would write a book for him in a second. Here's the next, uh, next question for you. Uh, if you could work with any artist, living or dead, on a specific title, which artist would you uh, would you like it to be, and on which title? Oh man, that is challenging. Uh, well, I'd love to work. I'd love to do a shadow book with Kevin Nolan, um, and he's alive. Uh, just because uh, he's one of my favorite artists that I've yet to work with. Um, but. If we're going like the impo the world, the realm of the impossible, I would love to do a Flex Mentallo comic with Seth, Seth Fisher, uh, who was uh, barely an acquaintance of mine because I was quite young, uh, but a great, great comic artist from the early 2000s that unfortunately passed away in, in the early 2000s. Amazing, amazing artist. He did uh, Flash, OGN, Green Lantern, Will World, uh, Batman, Snow, and Legends of the Dark Knight. Uh, would love to work on Flex, but honestly wish I could have a chance to work on any character with Seth, because he was, uh, if you look up his stuff, an amazing, amazing talent, uh, and something, something was really lost uh, when he when he went away. Yeah, very, he was very good. Now, okay, we we dove into the whole uh, revelations made in the Batman Shadows series uh, for DC. Will we see more revelations like what we saw in DC's Batman Shadow series in this new series? Um such as, you know, the revelation of being some of Bruce's old mentors, or um, will we, are you steer, completely steering clear of that aspect for this new series? Uh, well, there are, there, are quite, there are different questions asked in Shadow Batman. Uh, you know, the, the, the well, Batman Shadow Six isn't out yet. Uh, so, the, but the end of the of the first story does leave the Shadow in probably the lowest place he's been. Uh, you know, since he since he decided he was going to try to excuse me make amends. Uh, you know, however long ago it was that he decided that. Um, and a lot of the story of Shadow Batman sort of revolves around this idea. It, it's it's an answer to a lot of the questions and challenges the characters give themselves at the end of Batman Shadow. Uh, and in the case of the Shadow, uh, he's faced with a foe that in many ways is uh, a better version of him, in many ways is a more proficient uh, and successful version of the Shadow. And it forces him to look at himself and think about, finally, not what he knows, but what he doesn't know, or what he's been afraid to know for his entire life. And that question, uh, who the Shadow is, what does he really mean? And this is more, uh, you know, we've asked who is the Shadow in this arc, we're talking about the man behind the mask. But as of the end of the first story, the first miniseries, he's forced to really ask what the shadow means uh, at, it, at its core level, which is, which is one of the main uh, sort of lifeblood questions of Shadow Batman. You know, he uh, has long thought of it as a punishment for himself, a curse. You know, he does not think he's a good man. Uh, but the question of if that's true and what the shadow really means I would say is the biggest question of Shadow Batman. Okay, so it's clear that Dynamite doesn't really focus on continuity as much as, say, Marvel and DC. And um, you mentioned in uh, the Fueled by Death cast, uh, number 16 episode that I watched uh, the other day, that you prefer to build on what's come before. Is it more difficult for you creating an origin, an original story for a character like the Shadow where continuity isn't a big deal? Well, no, because in many ways for me, like when I write him, all those stories happen. Um, you know, sort of like, you know, there was a period where I was I was really hoping to work on a Tarzan book. And what I wanted to do was move it into the present day and say that, you know, he disappeared in 1963 or whenever the final actual Tarzan novel was published and then have that period of time in between where he was gone so that we could say that, you know, in, in theory, all these Tarzan stories happened. 
you know, in the same way that Grant, when he was on Batman, said, you know, all these Batman stories happen, even the crazy ones, even the 1960s ones where he got turned into a zebra, uh, happened. And so it's not, you know, it, it's actually not that much different uh, when there's loose continuity because I sort of force it upon myself anyway, you know? Like, especially with a character like the Shadow who who has sort of supernatural abilities and, 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 and mystery as power, uh, in, in my mind, maybe all those stories happen. You know, when you see his origin, uh, Splash in issue two, you know, we've got flashes of him from the Taken run, we've got flashes of him from the Baldwin movie, we have flashes of him from when Orson Welles played him, uh, you know, along with the Mike Kaluta series. In my mind, you know, potentially, uh, when I write him, all those things are part of his past. So it's an exciting moment because, yeah, if I want to, I can bend the rules a little more. Uh, but at the same time, like, I, in my mind, at least, I'm still just enriching all those things that came. And, and much like we're talking about the continuity of the both series, you can look at it and say that it's different from those stories and not connected. Or, like, we won't contradict them. So that if you want to look at it and say, man, this is all one giant story to me, uh, you could easily do that as well. And that's what I, I mean, that's what it's exciting. That's what's exciting to me to do uh, is to say that this is the combination of this character that has, that has arrived uh, after God, almost 80 years uh, of being out there. Um, how did that not approach you about writing the Shadow Batman series? Uh, was it because of your work on uh, DC's version of the story? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, that's really helped. I mean, Batman Shadow has been a super, super uh, exciting book to work on. You know, Scott and Riley are, are, are making me look great. Riley's doing the work of his career. I think he's getting the best work out of me that I've done in a long time. And it is, um, I think it was natural when they realized they were going to do a sequel to potentially reach out to me because I made no secret of the fact that I am a huge, just an, an insane fan of the Shadow and sort of what he represents. So, uh, especially because I've been wanting to work with Dynamite for a while. As I said, there was a period where I was really thinking about doing Tarzan. Uh, yeah, maybe like some I still really built. Great stuff right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, but it was just like, it, it was a perfect moment, you know, you know, to, to, to talk to them and say, oh, like, would you like to come back? Well, I would come back every time for the shadow as many times as I ask. And I think on some level they knew that. So I was excited to make it work. That's kind of like me with the phantom, you know, I would love to see a phantom shadow crossover. That's, That'd be kind of cool. yeah, yeah, I think that would be a uh, comic book nerd's dream come true right there. I really like the Phantom as well, so I would hopefully I'll get to work on him someday. I, I actually just found out upon meeting some friends at San Diego Comic-Con that the Phantom is the number one character in Australia. Yeah. Which I did not know. That's actually, yeah. Comics, right? No, he's Dynamite. He is Dynamite. Yeah. Well, he's, maybe we can get a Mask 3 and <laughs> get to be part of that. Well, it's kind of a hairy area with uh, the King Features characters, because even though they're dynamite, uh, the King Features still have their own kind of separate uh, universe inside the dynamite universe. Are there any characters you feel have been misinterpreted today, or are there any you would change? Um, I mean, that's a sticky area. I'm, you know, I'm not here to slag other creators. Um, I, man, I don't really know how to answer that. In a, in a way that, that's all right. We, it's just something um, I thought I'd throw in there. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, if I wrote the Phantom, uh, he would not look like Billy Zane, and he would not be uh, fighting Creed Williams, uh, and would probably not have a bunch of mansers. So I, we can talk about it that way, then. I, I love yeah, the yeah. Phantom, but I think he's problematic in many ways. Yeah, like I would like to see some of these older pulp heroes fight more than just... Their arch enemy is like, you know, the Phantom has the Singh Brotherhood. Uh, the Shadow has uh, Shiwan Khan. That that seems to be in all the comics. In the Shadow now, you had the Shadow versus Shiwan Khan for the umpteenth millionth time. I'd like to see some of the other villains get a little bit more of a spotlight in the book. Well, it's one of the reasons we created the stag for Batman Shadow is because we didn't want to go immediately to Khan. And also, I, you know, we struggle with a way. I mean excuse me, to, to not make Khan problematic, you know? Like, I mean, I, I, I love John Lone, uh, but Khan is a tough character uh, in, in many ways. And um, I think a lot of those pulp characters, it's it's an interesting dancing between the raindrops. I mean, even a character like Tarzan, I, it is, you, you with these characters, you have to find a way to bring forth what's great and unique about them, but also strip them of some of the colonialism that 
was not even hidden in their creation. I mean, I'm not shit talking Edgar Rice Burroughs to say that he hated English people and was pretty racist. Uh, I mean, in Tarzan itself, there's this, the, the original book. There's a scene where someone insults Jane, and you know her uh, her fiance is English. Uh, someone insults Jane, and her fiance does nothing. And Jane says to him, uh, you know, I wish I were a man so that I could respond uh, appropriately to an insult like that. And then the book says, being English, Jane's fiance had no idea what a man's response would be. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, his prejudices are not hidden. So, like, when you do these characters, you want to find a way, like, you want to invite more people in and show people why they're wonderful and sort of polish up and change, or I would say refashion at, at the least, some of the things that have not aged immediately well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there are things like that in a lot of characters from the 30s. Uh, and 40s. I mean, God, yeah. I mean, and and, and it's, it, it, but it's it can be done. In the case of the shadow, yeah. Like as I said, it's one of the reasons we wanted to do the stag because everybody expects uh, Khan, and he is an iconic villain. But you want to spread the spread it a little, spread it out a little bit. You want to explore other things. I mean, in the same in in the same relation to Batman's films, it's why Magpie and like Hellhound and things appear in Batman Shadow. Like, there's so many great eclectic. Uh, villains for these characters and it's interesting to cast the net a little wider um, but yeah I mean I, I think that that's a good way to answer that question I don't really want to you know deride the work of other creators or my contemporaries that you know there are always things that are differently that I would do differently to say the least you know, hopefully I'll be able to get a chance to get in there and do that with, with, with these characters you know like although I'll, I'll, I'll give a controversial opinion uh, though they are two of my favorite characters and one of them I've already mentioned, one thing I would change about Colossus and Martian Manhunter uh, is I would give them both pants. Because, <laughs> because, you know, we don't think anything of it. I mean, I loved Martian, I loved John's uh, Brightest Day redesign because it was basically classic, but he had pants. And, like, the thing about it is your eyes are tricked and you not realizing that he's basically wearing a stripper outfit. <laughs> and the same is true about Colossus with the original Cockrum design. Like when he is flesh colored, he looks like a professional. He looks like an exotic dancer. And Co and Dave Cockrum knew this actually, because when he because uh, he has he had open thighs when he had metal body, but when he went back to human form, mysteriously blue pants appeared. So he was very aware of what that looked like. So I guess yes, I would change those things about those characters. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my next question here. Uh, first off, um, I'm holding an issue of Batman issue 253, which was the um, first, I believe, the first meeting between Batman and the Shadow. Ever. Um, I also have, now this will serve as, um, this served as an introduction to the Shadow series in DC Comics. Um, so this was one of my favorite uh, comics growing up. What comics did you like to read growing up? Well, um, I mean, I my first books were like books I bought in the eighties at flea markets. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of quarter bit stuff. I mean, the first book I ever bought was uh, West Coast Avengers number sixteen, A Tale of Two Kitties. It had Hellcat and Tiger in it, um, along with like Red Jumpsuit Hank Pym. Uh, but as things sort of went on, it's interesting because the books I bought were all newsstand books. And every time I dropped in a comics until I dropped it in state, it was all during periods of extreme unrest. Like, the, like when I was when I was younger, the first Spider-Man comic I ever bought brand new was part of the Clone Saga, and it was the episode where Scarlet Spider invents impact webbing. And then I took a couple of years off, yeah. Yeah. I, and and then I bought like the first Electric Blue Superman issue of of uh, Action Comics, and I was just like uh, really into all the sort of strangeness of it. But it's funny because all those things are uh, controversial to say the least now, and in many ways it's shocking that I'm still in comics when those were my entry points. But I loved West Coast Avengers. Um, I, I mean, I loved JLA straight on, like Just League Europe, Just League International from the '80s. Um, I think those books being a part of the part of my life and th are why I sort of love these obscure and second and third and fourth and seventeenth tier characters. Uh, along with saying that my father was a sports memorabilia salesman, 
and I hate sports, so I would often buy uh, non-sport cards. So I have, like, my one of my first introductions to, like, a lot of comic book concepts came actually from these non-sports uh, trading card series. Yes. Uh, you know, things like the Golden, Silver, and Bronze Age, uh, Green Lanterns, for example, or, like, DC Super Teams, which actually had a Vertigo triptych. Uh, like, I kind of knew who these characters were without having any context for them uh, when I was very, very young, because I would collect all these series. Uh, and like, you know, oh, there's like a little bit of info on in the back uh, about who they are. And like, I have no idea what it means yet, but it was enough to get me to go and, and read on and find the books that are connected to them. That's actually probably the real first connection I had to these characters is through these, is through, excuse me, through trading cards. It's actually interesting you say that because I was introduced to comics almost the exact same way. I mean, I was familiar with them through the cartoons in the 80s, God, but so but with, like, the Flare and Flare Ultra cards along with uh, the Spider-Man cards and uh, Superman Electric Blue and uh, uh, the Clone Saga, though, that's pretty much what got me into comics hardcore. Uh, so it's really interesting you say that because now you look back on it today and there's so much... So many people hated the Clone Saga because it was just some cl cluster because of so many different uh, writers coming on and off of it and everything. And then the Electric Blue Superman was so controversial because it took away what Superman was known for and gave him completely different powers. Uh, but I actually enjoyed that. It, it changed things up. It wasn't the same stories rehashed all the time. Uh, who were some of your biggest influences in the comic book industry? And who were your biggest influences on a personal level? Um, I mean, within comics, I real. I mean, like, there's, there's no question. Like, I grew up reading Grant Morrison, Warren Ellis books. Um, and... You know, that that sort of has always been my sort of North Star when it comes to characterization and style and just doing the biggest, wildest stories I possibly can that are sort of extrapolated from new innovations in the real world. Um, uh, but at the same time, like, outside, who are my, who are personal influences, like, in my life yeah. outside of that? Right. Um, I don't know, people who are way more impressive than comics creators, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, I, it's weird because I don't, um, I don't, uh, you end up meeting like a lot of weird people in green rooms when you do, when you work in comics. Like I, I've, I've like stood in line for a vegan rap with, a, with many people who were like red shirt number five and still, and still trying to be someone. Uh, and like there, I, you know, I try to treat everyone just like people, you know, cause we're all just people doing a job. Uh, but so I don't know, like I, I met like John Lewis in, in an Amtrak station. Like I, I've never met anyone in comics. Like there's people I respect immensely, but I've never become like overwhelmed by meeting anyone, even if they've been like influences on my work. Uh, you know, but then again, I'm thinking about it. And as I said, like I met John Lewis and like, could not even uh, like speak to him. Like I couldn't even, uh, come up with something that wouldn't sound that they could even put into words, the weight of what that, uh, man has done. Uh, and, and this is someone, you know, I, I, I will, I will meet, you know, I will meet pro wrestlers and walk away with their phone number. I don't really care often who you are. Uh, but it was extremely moving to me, you know, and, and, to think like those are the people that actually inspire me. Like I love what comics represent and these sort of worlds of good and evil and how we can inspire people to be better. But then there are the people that are turning our world into that, you know, and living that day after day. And like the sort of weight of meeting someone like that to think like I'm, you know, I'm sitting like whatever stupid in the grand scheme comic meeting or business meeting I had in New York and I'm sitting in the Amtrak station and here is a guy uh, who I now have a one-to-one -one connection with Martin Luther King Jr. with, someone who, you know, uh, knew people who we deify in history. And it was just so enormous. And so, like, I don't know, it, it, those, those are the people uh, in many ways that I look up to. And, and the same goes for people who have done both. Like, it's, it's a cop-out answer, uh, but it's a real answer. And I wrote about it in the, in the, in the lat latest issue of the Commandy Challenge, like, you know, people like Jack Kirby, and it's his 100th birthday this year. People that I've never met, but I know, uh, talk the talk and walk the walk. You know, Kirby obviously created half of the worlds that we live in when we open comics these days. But here was also a guy who was at Normandy fighting real evil and, and, and came home 
un, unswayed, you know, and, and, and decided to continue working and, and doing more uh, to, to inspire people. Like, that's just so moving to me to, 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 to hear about people who continued the fight every day. You know, like, I, I read these stories about how people like, you know, fascists would visit the Marvel offices and be like, you know, where's that guy that does the Captain America comics? And, you know, Kirby would just say, well, guess time to do it again and, like, roll up his sleeves and walk downstairs to kick some ass. And it's just like, those are the people that actually inspire me because we, it, it's one thing to, to, to create these wish fulfillment uh, stories and, 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 and fictional worlds and do have these fictional pursuits. Uh, and they are important and they move people. Uh, but there are people who are heroes in everyday life and there are a lot of them. And, and those are the people that that really inspire me. I don't know, like, I thought I had people that I looked up to, but this thing with meeting John Lewis was like a month and a half ago for me, and I've really never been moved like that in my life in any real way. Like, I met President Clinton when I was in college, all these things, and never have I met someone uh, until then where I, like, was sitting on the train after, and, uh, like, I just felt like I'd done nothing, you know? Like, I was just overwhelmed with how much this person had done and is still doing it at, 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 at his age. And I really just felt like I'd done nothing. And, and, and that's aspirational to me. I said, oh, I got to keep going. I have to do more. I have to do more and more. Cause like I, I can do more. So, um, I don't know people who are unwavering like that, that have, that have lived this fight for, for goodness their whole life. The real people, those are the people that actually, uh, inspire me, I suppose. Well, that was awesome. That was awesome. I got to follow that up with this question. <laughs> Really? <laughs> okay. How would you go about bringing together, say, uh, the Shadow uh, with the Phantom and the Rocketeer in a story, if given the chance? Oh, well, uh, man, Rocketeer is such a good costume. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the odd one out is the Phantom in many ways. Uh, and I, I have to think about that. Because to me, like, the Rocketeer is all about discovery. So he is, in, the, in many ways, the way that Batman is a good thematic uh, counterpoint to the Shadow. Uh, Batman, as it, by, by definition, asks questions, and the Shadow, by definition, does not give answers. Um, Rocketeer is, you know, symbolizes freedom and exploration. So I do think that those two characters and their points of view are perfect ideological counterpoints and be very, very exciting. Because, and I think Cliff Secord is... Uh, a little more idealistic and a little more carefree than Bruce. So in the way that Bruce is unnerved uh, by not knowing the shadow, I think in the Rocketeer you'd have someone that's just like, not only do I not know, but I don't care. You know, like go be, you know, go be morbid over there because there's better things to do and there's a better way to do these things. So I find that interaction could be really, really cool. Uh, the, sh the Phantom is interesting. Uh, I think he splits the difference, right? Because he's, he's, he is a lot about obligation uh, in the way that the shadow is. Um, but at the same time, he is more adjusted than the shadow. He's had a normal human life. I mean, obviously, generally, if he didn't keep having normal human relationships and making more little phantoms, there'd be no more phantom. So, like, he, he, he finds a way to blend that sort of massive obligation of history uh, and legacy uh, with relatively normal human things. I think that's, I think that's, that, that's pretty interesting. Uh, how would you bring them together? Man, you need a new villain, right? Because you need to have, much like with the stag, you need to have something that mirrors at least facets of all three of those characters. And they're so diverse, um, you know, in my mind, you have to, you have to create something new. You have to create uh, th that perfect reflection of them uh, that can make them question somehow, you know, is a prism as a character that makes all three of those people, even though they're quite different, question who they are. And that maybe perhaps isn't the most in-depth answer as much as saying, like, well, you would use Moriarty. <laughs> but uh, that is sort of how I think about things. Maybe you could uh, maybe you could kind of go to Dynamite or some of these other companies and uh, kind of tell them a story about how you would uh, bring these three together and maybe we could actually get it to happen. I, mean, I think that'd be really cool. I haven't seen anything really like that in comics before with three yeah, such... Here such completely opposite characters um i i think that would be amazing and i i think you'd be the person to do that uh with your knowledge of the shadow and um how you talk about the phantom and the rocketeer i i think you'd be the person to you know 
create that story, honestly. I mean, I would like to do it. It's, it's interesting. Like, I do like, have you guys ever, do you guys know about Philip Jose Farmer? No. Well, he's a weird dude. Uh, he created the World Newton Universe, and it was, uh, I mean, it's sort of like a dirty League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Like, he created uh, pseudo versions of a lot of pulp characters and, and, and then wanted to say and spin these stories about how they were all uh, interrelated. But at the same time, he was like, really into uh, examining sex and masculinity. So he wrote uh, this book called, I mean, in that universe, he had like Doc Savage and he had, he had Doc Savage-esque characters and Tarzan-type characters and all these things. It's kind of like planetary, but in the 1930s and books instead of comics. And the and, and he wrote, I'm just thinking about like retcons that, that happen in these stories and how absurd they get. And he wrote this book called A Feast a feast unknown. And you know, before I go into the story, is there an age rating on this podcast? No. Good, because this is going to get real, real. So, <laughs> um, A Feast Unknown is an actual book uh, that he wrote that is, in many ways, his best or worst book. And it's the only one I tell people that they should read if they think it's funny. And it's a book where he reveals that Doc Savage and Tarzan are both the illegitimate, illegitimate children of Jack the Ripper. And uh, because why not? And, and, and because of this, uh, they can only reach arousal in periods of extreme brutality. Um, and so, like, a lot of the book is, like, Doc Savage, like, blows up a bunch of pirates and then immediately ejaculates. <laughs> uh, and, wow. and it culminates, oh, I'm not even done, and they're, like, they're all hundreds of years old, and you find out that they all, every hundred years or whatever, 50 years, they have to go to this place, like, in the jungle, quote, and uh, at, at this point, they cut out one of their testicles, sacrifice it to some god, and then they get, like, another, like, ten years of immortality somehow. And the whole book culminates them in them literally jousting with their own erections. Uh, Wouldn't it is eventually run out of testicles? <laughs> no, it regrows. No. Because it, it regrows. <laughs> uh, it, it is an absurd, absurd book. Um, but I'm just thinking of, like, it, for whatever reason, it popped into my mind, like, how could you blend the worlds of Phantom and uh, Shadow and, and Rocketeer? And I was like, well, I know how not to do it. Yeah, hopefully not by sacrificing <laughs> testicles. And, and this is it. Like, I don't know, like, part of me wants to adapt that book someday as some sort of, like, extreme Bauhaus farce. <laughs> um, maybe under a pseudonym. Um, but now you guys will know it's me if I do it, so... <laughs> Okay, so in, in a previous interview, uh, I heard that you'd like to bring back Miss Fury and write her stories. Uh, do you think Dynamite series did her justice? And do you consider her a Catwoman ripoff uh, since she did come out a few years after Catwoman? And did you enjoy the Death Defying Daredevil story arc in Project Superpowers and the big twist the writers put into that? Uh, well,. I should say I thought that someone I think that Miss Fury should be brought back and celebrated as as one of the first comic heroines created by a female comic creator. Uh, in that same breath, I don't think that I'm the one to do it uh, because um, you know I, I I'm not a woman and I would like to see that I would like to see that legacy of Tarpy Mills be continued in that way. But I do wish it would happen, uh, and I do think that it's something I wish more people knew about. And, and was celebrated more because it's just so special. Uh, and, and I try to talk about her all the time. Um, uh, I think that I mean, any, any series that is going to put these characters in the forefront and we showcase them, uh, this question of, did they do them justice? Like, again, like people worked immensely hard on those books and I, I would, I don't like to talk about other creators. I, I I'm, a, but I am really, really excited that people would want to feature them and give them a showcase again. And I, and, and I hope that they continue to have really sort of great pedestals and even more notoriety uh, for characters like that, like Daredevil, characters like the Death Defined Devil, Daredevil, uh, and characters like Miss Fury. Um, I didn't mind the Death Defying Devil uh, uh, revelation, as you said, uh, in Project Superpowers. Um, but you know, I, I like, I, I, I'm just so happy whenever these characters appear. I mean, I loved his appearances in Savage Dragon, which were totally, totally different. Um, you know, I don't necessarily subscribe as a, as a creator and even as a reader to this idea of right, as long as the core of the character is true, 
I don't really subscribe to these like, oh, right and wrong interpretations of the character because, I mean, look how many, look how malleable Batman is. Look how many different things Batman could be while still being Batman. Um, you know, from the guy running with the bomb labeled bomb to like swear to me in 50 years. Uh, and it's all still Batman. So uh, I, I celebrate any interpretation of these characters as long as they understand the core. Um, and as for her being a ripoff of Catwoman, I don't really think so. Um, I think she's. Pro- I think she progressed in a different sort of direction. And it's obviously Catwoman has progressed in a different sort of direction. So at the time, you know, may, I, I can't. You can't deny that, that. You know, maybe there's a correlation there. But obviously, there's there's a correlation even from a legal sense between Captain Marvel and Superman, and those characters have still evolved into immensely different characters. Right. The only reason I ask that because I'm just getting into Dynamite. I, for the past few months, I just started getting into the old uh, Paul Heroes. I've liked the Shadow ever since the old sh- the Alec Baldwin movie came out, and the Phantom with the Billy Zane movie. Um, but I just got introduced to Miss Fury through uh, Masks. Um, which I thought was really good. It I, it made me want to do more research on the character and all the other characters involved in the uh, situation. And I thought maybe since you know you were far more familiar with her than I am, I thought maybe you could shed a little bit more light on that. Of that's the only reason I asked those questions. What about a Shadow Green Hornet crossover? That's been done. Has it been done uh, with Dark, masks? Dark Knights? Oh, which uh, I just finished reading. Um, because I'm also a big Green Hornet fan, so anytime I can throw a Green Hornet in the mix. <laughs> I mean, I love that the Green Hornet is the Lone Ranger. Is what is he grandson, yeah, nephew? Uh, what is a nephew? Great ne- gra- nephew. Yeah. I mean, I love revelations like that. Any anytime you can s- sort of enrich things, like I don't like the idea. Like to me, retcon always seems to have like a negative connotation uh, for whatever reason. But if you can enrich the story by adding connections. I love that stuff, you know, and sometimes it's the easiest, most elegant thing. Like Airway, for example, is also named Hal Jordan and uh, by complete happenstance. And it was, it was such a clean thing to just say, oh, well, he's Hal Jordan's cousin and they're both named after the same person. Hmm. You know, Green Lantern and Hal Jordan. I'm sorry, their names are both Hal Jordan, so I wasn't clear. Um, you know who you're talking about because we're big Green Lantern fans. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, in, in the same way, I thought it was very elegant how Jeff explained there being two Wally West. Now, honestly, it was the same explanation. But uh, but it's very, but it's very, oh, my God, I just mugged towards the computer with, like, a Groucho Marx whisper as if you guys could see me when I said that, which was absurd. Like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> Uh, but as if he's, like, in the room. Uh, but, um, I mean, I think that... I don't think the definitive, uh, outside of the core stories, I don't think the definitive Miss Fury story has been told. And I talk about her a lot, but all I will say is that I I, I would be really excited, uh, and I keep pushing for it to be told, and for her to get the sort of re-welcoming uh, into, into, into the greater comics world that she deserves. So I hope it is. I'll do everything I can if people ask me to sort of spread the word and help. Because, you know, we, we have, as an industry, we have to acknowledge our past and celebrate our past. And, 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 and Ms. Mills is an important part of that. And I wish more people, I always get excited when people talk about it. So that, that's really what I'm doing. Uh, like when, when, when we have history, uh, we shouldn't keep it hidden. And, and I feel really passionate about that. Yeah. We, we do everything we can to promote uh, lesser known comic book characters, lesser known publishers, um, and just forgotten heroes on our YouTube channel. Right. Uh, so it's great to find an, uh, a writer who enjoys doing the same thing that we do, because you see all these other YouTube channels and everything that are, they promote the big two Marvel and DC, which we're not afraid to do. No, uh, they promote Batman, they promote uh, Spider-Man and all that, but they leave out the most important heroes, the ones that really got things going. There wouldn't, there would be no Batman without the Shadow, without the Phantom, without uh, the Black Bat. So that that's really what we like to push. On without without, uh, without Bill Finger as well. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you thought about adding the Scarecrow into this Batman Shadow crossover at all? Because uh, I would really be interested to see how the Shadow would. Uh, take to the scarecrow uh, i would be interested to see how the shadow would t- how the scarecrow would take to the shadow yeah who would scare who well, well he did appear in four uh not as not as like a you know a, a focused player 
Um, but it would be interesting to explore that further. I mean, that, that, that's actually, I mean, they do have a really great sort of psychological aspect uh, that you could explore between Shadow and, and uh, Scarecrow. So um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see if he pops up again. Uh, there are, as I said, we are going into some new places with the Shadow Batman. Um, but it's a great point, uh, and there is a lot to dig out uh, between those two characters, so hopefully we get a chance. Okay, now, well, this Dynamite version, well, is it just a miniseries, or is it going to be an ongoing thing? Uh, I, the Whoever runs the uh, Dynamite Comics Twitter page didn't, wasn't really specific on that part. She just said, yes, <laughs> it wasn't really... Is it just a miniseries, like with DC's version, or is it just going to be a ongoing monthly i mean it's a mini series I, I don't know if i was supposed to tell you that if they're being mysterious about it but no it's a mini series i mean i, I try to do things that have when you have a, a statement to make you want to make sure you can make them and, and, and do it succinctly and have a beginning middle and end so it is i mean it, it is a six issue mini series okay very cool that's pretty awesome so we're going to have a full 12 uh 12 issues total um Batman yeah, between DC and uh, yeah. Dynamite. That's cool. Yeah, and God help whatever lawyer has to figure out if they ever get collected in one book. But uh... <laughs> um, is there anything you want to add before we uh, close out this interview, John? Um, thanks for allowing us to uh, interview you and takes up some of your time here. Uh, it's been an, an amazing hour, almost. Yeah, just so. about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it went in directions that. You probably didn't think it was going to go in. <laughs> I will go to bed with my testicles covered tonight. <laughs> so, again, thank you. Thanks for letting us take up some of your time. Um, Do you have any conventions coming up uh, this year? Yeah, I'll be at um, I'll be at FlameCon in Brooklyn in August. I'll be at uh, Baltimore Comic Con in September. And then I'll be at New York Comic Con uh, whenever New York Comic Con is. <laughs> um, October? I think it's in October. Do you know if you'll be attending C2E2 next year? Oh, next year? Not year I do not know. Too far ahead then. Uh, yeah, I don't know yet. I loved going to C2E2. It was the first time I'd gone uh, in 17 years uh, to Chicago for any reason. And um, I really, really liked it. So I don't know if I'll be back yet. I try to not do, except for like the big two, I try to do different shows every year. Um, but I did really enjoy it. So uh, nothing is off the table right yet. Awesome, because I'm, I'm going to try to go to see you next year. So, yeah. this is my first um, And is there anything you'd like to say to your fan, to the fans of yours personally, or uh, of Batman in the Shadow in general? Um, maybe hint at things to come a little bit more. Uh, sure. Well, like, like I said, uh, you know, in regards to Batman Shadow, uh, things are just going to keep getting bigger and bigger, uh, and, and and the scope. We are incredibly lucky. The DC and, and Condé Nast have let us tell a story of the scope that we are uh, in Batman Shadow with the repercussions it has for the characters, at least within the confines of the story itself. Uh, and then to be able to pick up the pieces where we leave them in Shadow Batman and show the, and show the growth from this point that we leave them at. Um, that in many ways is like, you know, the, you know, Batman Shadow in many ways ends with the Empire, at the Empire Strikes, Empire Strikes Back moment for these characters. Um, and to be able to return and, 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 and now that we've scattered the pieces on the board, uh, build them back up, uh, and finally potentially, uh, make a final statement for all these characters and not just for Shadow and Batman, but for the concept of crime fighting, the concept of heroic legacy itself. Uh, is an amazing, amazing opportunity. And and where we uh, push the characters to the limit in Batman Shadow and Shadow Batman, we show characters that have always thought that they're sort of at the top of their world, that there's a greater world around them. And if and if Shadow Batman, uh, Batman Shadow was about them facing mortality um, in regards to themselves, uh, Shadow Batman is about them facing that in regards to the greater world around them. They're fighting villains that have been making moves in centuries. Batman and the Shadow have been making moves in weeks and days. Uh, and, and it is really going to be a challenge that forces them to do things differently, change who how, who, and how they do things. And uh, I couldn't, couldn't be more excited about it. And at the same time, working with Robin, working with Giovanni Timpano, uh, it is a, going to be a classic, beautifully illustrated Shadow story 
classic, beautifully illustrated Batman story. Uh, it's going to be really, really amazing. Nice. Can't wait. <laughs> Again, thank you for your time. We'll let you go off and enjoy the rest of your evening um, and enjoy the uh, conventions you have coming up. And uh, have a safe tr safe trip. Uh, you said that you're getting ready to head back out on another trip here soon. I will. Uh, I'll be I'll be I'll be on a plane tomorrow, but I'll be writing comics. So things will <laughs> things will keep moving. Promise. All right. All right. Well, well, thanks. Thanks, again. thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. I will talk to you folks soon. Thank right. you. Thank you. Hey guys, Shannon here. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share these videos with your family and friends. Because every time you do, you protect the memory of lesser known heroes from the golden age and beyond.